so in terms of what actually goes into reconditioning a DEM, you know, to get a DEM that's at a fairly high scale or high precision of accuracy, it, it takes a lot of uh, manpower to get there. You know, this just shows an example of the southern portion of the Red River Basin where a reconditioning project was completed to develop HEC HMS hydraulic mo or excuse me, hydrologic models. And you can see here approximately 140,000 bird lines had to be utilized to get a DEM to serve that specific purpose. And you know, those 140,000 burn lines constitutes a user sitting and determining whether or not a culvert exists at that location and actually drawing a line in to represent the culvert so it can be um, accounted for during the processing to create the hydro DEM. Once we've completed applying the reconditioning to the base DEM, we move into what's called the non-contributing analysis. Um, when we do the non-contributing analysis, really what we're doing is we're weighing um, the storage available at various locations in the landscape um, to the ability of those same locations to be able to produce runoff to determine is there sufficient storage that those areas exhibit characteristics that we think would uh, make them likely to be non-contributing. Um, basically non-contributing basins, things such as potholes within the landscape we're looking for, uh, and things like existing lakes and wetlands as well. Now what we're going to, um, these next few slides we're going to be going through I think will really help illustrate what we're actually doing during the, the non-contributing analysis to determine whether or not uh, certain portions of the landscape are contributing versus non-contributing. So as you can see here on the slide, the blue correlates to higher elevations, the brown correlates to lower elevations, and you can see that there's a, a pothole within the landscape that exists at this particular location right here. So what we're trying to do is determine whether or not that pothole is contributing versus non-contributing. Now if we were just to assume that all the potholes in the landscape are contributing, um, or in this case that one particular pothole were contributing, we'd be left with a uh, drainage network and a drainage, drainage divide that looks something like what you see illustrated on your screen here where essentially flow is allowed to enter the pothole and also continue on downstream to our point of interest which is uh, down at this location right here. Now what the processing um, that we've been doing to evaluate non-contributing areas would take into account is we'd use the drainage area to that pothole in the landscape to analyze the runoff that's produced for a given rainfall event. Once we know that, we can derive what the storage is um, below the spill elevation for that given pothole, and then compare that runoff volume to the available storage volume to determine whether or not that area is non-contributing. So if runoff is greater than the available storage, then that area would then be contributing. However, in this case, runoff was less than the available storage. So in that particular instance, there would be sufficient storage to contain all the runoff that could be produced for our analyzed rainfall event, and that would make that area non-contributing to points downstream. And as you can see, um, by removing this particular drainage area from our uh, hydrographic network, we've reduced the contributing area at this point by approximately a third. So there, there is potential, especially in areas uh, with a lot of potholes in the landscape to, to really reduce what the contributing area actually is um, at points downstream. Now this next series of slides I think is really going to help illustrate the iterative nature of this whole non-contributing analysis that we've been doing. So basically what you're seeing here is just a series of potholes that if were to fill until they spilled out would continue to spill into a into a potholes further downstream. So to account for the excess runoff that's produced, or potentially excess runoff that's produced at the pothole above it or upstream of it, um, we go through an iterative process to, until we reach a point where um, no more excess runoff, if you will, is produced across the landscape. So we'll switch to an aerial photo view background here, but our first iteration of the non-contributing analysis would yield um, these blue potholes or blue polygons that you see here, which are I which the computer interprets as being isolated basins on the landscape that have an associated drainage area with them, which is depicted by the black line that you see here. So again, we go through the whole process of determining the runoff volume and comparing it to the available storage volume. When we do that, what we find is that um, 
majority of these basins do not have sufficient storage for the runoff produced for a given event. Uh, that's depicted here by the red basins that you can see. Um, so basically these basins just continue to spill out. Um, so like in this particular instance, this basin spills out here, kind of hops down here until you get to the blue basin. The blue basins, on the other hand, did have sufficient storage for the runoff produced, meaning there's less runoff than the storage, so they remained non-contributing for this particular iteration. Um, what, we're, what the next step is going to do is we're actually going to account for the excess runoff from the basins above it and how that affects um, the remaining available storage for each one of these particular basins. So when we take a look at the excess runoff produced from the basins above the blue basins, what we're left with is the basin at the bottom of the hill or at the bottom of your screen here, the screen here still does have sufficient storage that it contains all runoff produced for everything upstream of it. However, what we also find is that um, the, the blue basin a little bit further up at this location does not have sufficient storage to contain the runoff produced from its local watershed as well as, as the basins above it. So that area then becomes contributing to points downstream. And again, you know, once we have those areas defined, we can take a look at what the hydrographic network is that, that contributes to each one of these particular basins. You can see how they're linked together, which is illustrated with the blue line here, so how they would actually spill out into the next basin downstream and continue on until it got to either a contributing waterway or else a, a non-contributing basin that has sufficient storage to, to capture all the runoff produced. This is just another way of looking at how the entire system is connected and this actually was, this got us to a point where um, this particular basin was non-contributing for a 100 year 10 day runoff event based on the storage available not only at the bottom of the hill but also all those other potholes that you see that were flagged during our initial iteration of the non-contributing analysis. Once the non-contributing analysis has been complete, the next step in our uh, in our uh, flowchart that you see here is the stakeholder review. This is a step that we try and incorporate in all of our reconditioning projects, recognizing that um, despite expertise in uh, GIS processing related to this train analysis work, there are certain things where it's of extreme value to have um, a local practitioner take a look at the results of what we produce to make sure it's reflecting what they actually see on the landscape as they're out there um, on a day-to-day -day type basis. So typically what we do is we go through one iteration of the uh, reconditioning along with the non-contributing analysis. Um, as we're going through that, we try and flag areas that we think um, are questionable that we'd like them to go out to review. And then also just ask for kind of an overall re review of some of the flow paths and drainage divides that we're coming up with to make sure they make sense with what they've actually seen out in the field. So typically that data is provided to um, a local government unit or, or whoever or whoever we may be working with on a particular project and they'll actually go out in the field and take a look at those locations you know things like letting us know if there's a culvert there um, we've got a non-contributing area is it truly non-contributing or is there some type of a tile inlet at that location um, things of that nature just to really kind of more of a validation and a gut check if you will of what we're producing for a, a hydro DEM at the end of the day um, once we've gone through that process, we generally take that information back to the drawing board or back to square one and go through and apply the reconditioning in a manner that reflects the comments that re re we received during the stakeholder review process and again uh, produce the non-contributing analysis to determine which portions of the watershed are non-contributing. And then in some instances we'll actually provide that information back just to make sure we didn't get it wrong a second time in some of those locations and um, work our way through that process again. So um, again, the goal of this is to provide a LIDAR data set that best reflects the drainage patterns for the intended use of the data set. And to do that we really need input from the 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 local practitioners on the landscape that, that work within whatever your project watershed is, watershed is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, 
well, you see down here at the bottom, your land prioritization or really any data layers derived from a hydro DEM are only as good as the input reconditioned DEM at the end of the day. And we really feel that that uh, local stakeholder review level is, is really important in providing a quality product.